Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is September the 2nd, 2014, and my guest is Elizabeth Green. She is the author of Building a Better Teacher, How Teaching Works and How to Teach It to Everyone. Elizabeth, welcome to Econ Talk. Hi, thanks for having me. Your book's a history of the recent attempts to improve K-12 through education in America. Let's start with the basic question. Is it possible to build a better teacher? I think it is. I think it's possible. Um, I think that the history of education would tell you perhaps otherwise because we have had so much trouble seeing teaching change over time. But I think that there are enough cases and evidence um, to suggest that it is possible to help people do this better and improve. But there is a view out there that you talk about it at some length in the book that – some people believe great teachers are just born and not made and that there is a certain it quality that teachers have that, that make them more effective in the classroom in all kinds of dimensions. Uh, what do you think of that argument and um, why is it an important argument in the debate? I think that um, – well, so I think that that argument is embedded in the way we talk about – education policy, teacher policy, we say, you know, there are good teachers and then there are bad teachers. And what we need to do is either find more of the good teachers, people who are destined to become good by doing a better job of recruiting good teachers, or we need to incentivize good teachers to stay, or we need to create better, easier, more effective ways to remove bad teachers from the classroom. And I think that what that um, construct is built on is, as you say, this assumption that um, teaching quality is something that's natural born in people, that it's about personality traits or character traits. But in fact, uh, every research study that's tried to connect character traits and personality traits to who becomes an effective teacher fails to find that any of them make any difference. So you can be an extrovert or an introvert, uh, it doesn't matter for how effective you'll be in the classroom. Um, So I think that what instead is more convincing to me is the fact that what matters are what teachers do and what they know. And that's uh, very different from a natural born trait. It's something that you need to learn. So we're going to talk about Doug Lamov, who was a a guest here on Econ Talk, uh, and he plays a a large role in your book. But one of the things he emphasizes, of course, is practice. So one view says the reason we don't have better teachers is they don't practice. What do you think of that argument? Um, yeah, and I think, I think that, uh, so Doug is obviously a, um, for people who listen to your show, they know that he's a former teacher who became a, uh, the leader of a group of schools called the Uncommon Schools Network. Um, and he encountered the same realization that, uh, what he called the build it, buy it problem. So at first, early on, he had tried to improve the quality of teaching in his schools by, Um, buying uh, teachers who are already good. But over time, that became unsustainable, and he realized he had to help build good teachers from uh, any person that he could recruit. So he couldn't just recruit his way to excellence. He had to build it, and um, and in the process of trying to build it, he had to think about what does it mean to help people improve, and absolutely one of the elements that's historically been missing is thinking about teaching as a craft that you would have to practice or learn. So um, what he tries to build and what I think is one of the pieces of evidence for why we can build better teachers is systems for helping teachers do what another researcher calls approximations of practice. So before they go into the classroom, how can you create a scenario that's not exactly a classroom, but that has some of the key features of a classroom so that teachers can practice key moves and hone key ideas that they'll need to master before they get into the classroom. So if uh, if you were principal of a school, or let's say Doug Lamov was, 
Um, <laughs> what do you think? Let's say it's a good school, not a horrible school. We're not talking about a, a disaster. We're talking about, you know, an okay, regular American public school, not a charter school where where, where Doug has has been uh, been working and I think I suspect has been very effective. But let's just go into a regular school and we make Doug the principal or we make you or I the principal. What do you think could be implemented in that setting that would make the teachers there who, of course, range from, you know, probably some not so good ones, some probably very good ones already. What could be done to make those teachers better? Do you think that a Doug Lamov or a, a principal who understood the lessons of your book could could go in there and make a difference and improve the quality of the learning? Yes, I think so. I think, I mean, in terms of what they could practice, there's lots of key moves um, in teaching that are important that are possible to practice and same, same with ideas that can be drawn out and knowledge that can be drawn out through the act of practicing. So um, one example, uh, a key piece of any classroom is figuring out how to monitor students while they're working independently. So you can take these very discrete slices and that's an important part of any teacher's um, work. There's important questions that are raised while you're monitoring students while they work independently. One is, when do you intervene? Another is how do you manage to keep the students focused while also giving some individual attention to different students? Um, another is, uh, at, you know, not just when do you intervene, but how do you intervene? So if a student's making a mistake, do you correct the mistake? Do you redirect? Do you consider another problem? At what point do you end the, the independent work? So this is like a one scenario which you can allow teachers to practice. And I've seen this happen where teachers will practice with um, their peers acting the part of student. And uh, also what can be worked on within that sort of bucket of work that teachers can practice together is um, a problem itself. So the, the academic content that the students are working on together. And just by having discrete opportunities like this to focus on one slice of the work of teaching, I think a lot can be opened up. It could change the way teachers think about their work and give them real opportunities to learn from one another. So I totally agree with that. And as listeners know, my wife's a math teacher. She's also used a lot of Doug Lamov's techniques from his books, and she's convinced, maybe fooling herself, but I think she's right. She has convinced herself that she is a better teacher, that not just that she's got to say a quieter classroom uh, mm -hmm. or, a, or a happier classroom, two things that are pleasant, but not really what she sees as her job, but she has a classroom where students across the board, meaning not just the top tier, that all of her students have a better grasp of the material. So mm -hmm. I, I think you're right. Now, my data set's small. <laughs> it's one sample <laughs> point. But as you point out, a lot of people looked at this, tried to figure out whether it works. It's very hard to measure things in education, but I, let's, let's say okay. it's true. So right. that raises the following question. Why aren't teachers who, uh, students who major in education learning these techniques and why aren't they being taught them either there or after the fact when they get on the job unless they happen to work in a charter school system that takes this kind of approach? I think there's a few reasons. Um, one of the reasons that I was surprised by is that in within the scholarship about education, so schools of education, departments of education, folks whose job title is professor of education, um, there's very little focus on teaching as a as a craft or even something to be studied at all. And I was surprised to find that this goes back to the father fathers of education research. Um, so, and the the key moment in time that the shift happened was the taking over of teacher training by universities. Um, so when universities took over teacher training and created the first um, real professors of education, uh, what they did was they recruited people from other disciplines to do this job. So they would recruit um, people who studied psychology, for example. That was one of the first major fields to be imported into schools of education. And um, then they would have these psychologists. And, you know, it makes sense if you study psychology or it's a certain studying. logic. Right, right. You're studying learning and teaching is very related to learning. But the professors of education, even in psychology, did not have any interest in teaching. In fact, the um, guy who's known as the father of educational psychology, Edward Thorn Thorndike, um, he 
told uh, people that he thought schools were boring. He didn't like to visit them. And when he once was speaking to a group of educators um, and a principal asked him a, a real pra- problem of practice, you know, this thing happened in my school today. What, what should I do? What would you do, Professor Thorndike? And Professor Thorndike told him, do? Why, I'd resign. He had absolutely no interest in, in real problems of practice. And I think that's carried through. So today we have... Um, in education schools, we have people who study the history of education, the psychology of education, the economics of education, but we have very few people who study teaching itself as a craft. And as a result, um, the folks who are left to train teachers in, in teaching methods um, are drawing on a very impoverished science and they have very little to draw on. There's been a little bit of a change in the last 20 years and that's what I write my book about. I think there are emerging ideas about what teachers should be able to do, but it's kind of no surprise that teachers aren't, that they don't leave um, teacher training prepared for the classroom when we haven't really put any resources into figuring out what they, we should be preparing them to do. Yeah, there's another factor I think that gets neglected, um, which is the culture of universities themselves. If, um, if you teach in a business school or even a law school, uh, there's a certain embarrassment and I've taught in a business school, so um, I think I'm right. Mm-hmm. It's a certain mm-hmm. embarrassment that you're not as scholarly mm-hmm. as the other parts of the university. And so I think a lot of business schools and law schools push away from being seen as a trade school. Of course, yes. the students certainly see it as a trade school. They they want to right. learn how to do it. They want to learn how to be lawyers. They want to learn how to be managers. But instead, what they're often taught is the uh, theories of management, not the practice yeah. of management, for example. Yeah. And what changed in business schools, interestingly, I, I think that that's a parody. That's a little bit of a parody, what I just said, a little bit of an exaggeration. What What has changed is that business schools, schools started getting ranked. And that mm. forced schools, and some of the rankings had to do with how happy their students were. So that actually forced <laughs> business schools to see their MBAs, for example, as customers. And yes. since the customers actually want to learn how to succeed in business yes. with trying or without, they um, they actually wanted something a little bit different in the cl- in the classroom, something a little more, quote, realistic. And I yes. think education schools have a similar problem. They're they're but they're a bit immune uh, to that customer focus, at least so far. Yeah, the incentives are really misaligned. So the education schools financially are kept afloat and not just education schools, but my understanding is the economics go to other parts of the university. Education schools are cash cows. And um, the reason is that they're training teachers, the largest of all of the professional professions that we have, 3.7 million people in this country with huge turnover rates that mean we need hundreds of thousands of new teachers every single year. Um, so it's a great business to be in, but the people who are training those people do not have any incentive to leave them prepared. And so there's been now a new conversation like, well, maybe we should, and before we graduate a person from an education school, actually uh, make sure that they can do some of the core practices that you know Doug writes about and um, uh, other researchers have talked about that are what a responsible teacher should be able to do, but is that really in an education school's interest to do that? Because they will graduate fewer students if they create such a bar. So it's, yeah, there's an incentive problem too. Yeah. But I think part of, again, is cultural, not just financial. I think the, um, a lot of teachers of education right now don't want to be in that business. Even if, even if a school said, Hey, there's a market opportunity here. Let's teach mm-hmm. our students the craft of teaching. The current faculty at most education departments would say, eh, I don't want to dirty my hands. They're like Professor Thorndike. Uh, right. They'd much rather um, pretend they're yeah. like other scholars at their university, which they're what they were trained to be, actually. So it makes some sense. Yes, and it's a worse problem probably in uh, education schools than in business or law schools because not only are they lowering themselves from – you know, as you say, theory to practice, but they're also lowering themselves to one of the lowest prestige professions, um, which most, which many people still don't think requires any training, including some of the education school deans that I talk to for my book. So yes, there's a big cultural problem too. I, I agree. Yeah, it's interesting you call it low prestige, but, um, and certainly there are jobs that have higher prestige, but there, there are a lot of glorious things about being a teacher. Um, and I think a lot of people 
uh, respect teachers. Uh, so it's interesting. I, I do think there's that impression that it's sort mm-hmm. of an unappreciated profession. But uh, I certainly appreciate my t- stu- my kids' great teachers. And uh, I know that the parents of my wife's students, uh, my wife's yeah. students, uh, appreciate her tremendously. So I, I, there is a lot of non-financial reward for being a great teacher, I think. I I agree. And there's a strange duality. I think on one hand, um, there, there could be no more respected profession in some ways. It's almost like a secular priesthood. Um, but in other ways, I think there's no doubt that uh, teaching is lower prestige in terms of, um, you know, not just finance, what the salary is, but how we think about the complexity of the work. Um, I think, you know, that we assume that there's a marching order in which the professor is the highest and uh, at a university level, and then teachers are are lower because it requires less um, challenge, c- cognitive challenge. But I actually think that that's really, really wrong. And so I, you know, I think one of the things I found in my own reporting is as much as I claim to respect teachers and certainly have a deep appreciation for my own great teachers in my life who absolutely changed the course of my life. Um, I also came to realize that I did not recognize the degree of complexity that they were doing because the best teachers do that and make it look invisible and make it look easy. Um, it's a great point. So I think that's one important thing to to change the understanding of. Yeah, it's a great point. I, you're right because the content can can be relatively accessible, but that doesn't mean that conveying the content so that people understand it and learn it is easy. It's not. And it's also yeah. it's also exhaustingly hard work. I think people totally misappreciate and misunderstand how uh, draining it is to be a teacher for for a full day in a, in a high school or a middle school or a lower school. It's incredible uh, challenge physically and emotionally. Yes, and and I think seeing why that is is also important. Like I I used to think about um, my teacher friends and see how hard they were working and how, as you say, emotionally, physically drained they were by the end of the day. But it was only when I started to write this book and see inside the minds of teachers that I could understand some of the factors beyond like dealing with a bunch of adolescents or even children, um, you know, that would lead to that. And it's, it's not, it's part of it is a huge part of it is the academic and cognitive challenge. So just, you know, even teaching elementary school, it may be very easy to do elementary school content for adults, but that doesn't mean that it's easy to diagnose a student's misunderstanding of, um, dividing fractions or um, negative numbers or the meaning of zero or how to read, you know, a very challenging task um, to uh, teach someone to do. Easy for us to do as adults, but really, really complex and not just teach one person, but 30 people at a time. Or if you're uh, in a departmentalized system, a hundred and more students at a time. So it's it's cognitively just as taxing, I think, as it is emotionally and physically. Let's talk about classroom discipline. Um, one of the hardest things about being a teacher is controlling the classroom. And some teachers, as you talk about in your book, they they seem to just command the room. They walk in, the students are attentive. Uh, anybody who steps out of line, the, the teacher somehow manages to just get them right back because they have this charisma or whatever it is. And others, especially new teachers, can can really spiral into a horrible situation where the students yeah. test them. They push them and the teacher starts screaming and then it just spirals out of control. Um, but you point out that that you can actually learn to be better at this seemingly uh, a God-given ta- uh, skill. Yes. Uh, what are some of the techniques that, that people have, have come to understand work to make people better, uh, teachers better, discipline, disciplinarians? Well, um, so I think the common trait that they all have is that they're very counterintuitive. So, for example... Doug Lamov talks about um, the fundamental ambiguity of shh. So what is an average adult's um, in, intuitive response to a group of children talking out of turn? Um, we tell them to shh. And uh, Doug points out that this is problematic for a few reasons. Um, one of them is, are you asking students to stop talking or are you asking them to talk more quietly? And, uh, you know, I think that even students who are trying to follow directions need um, that specificity, even if they're acting in the best intentions. Um, and then the, the question is, well, what do you, 
the, the other problem with this shh is that it draws attention to the misbehavior rather than describing what students ought to do instead. So that's another of Doug's techniques is what to do. Um, so what good teachers do to manage a classroom is describe in great specificity exactly what their expectations of students are. And that might sound um, obvious, but it's really not the common response. Again, when um, for example, he describes a moment when a student is being so disruptive that he needs to take that student out of a classroom and send him to the dean's office. Um, and this is one of those terrifying moments that, you know, as a bystander watching teachers deal with this, I can see, um, you know, I, I would have no idea what to do. There's an emotional student, doesn't want to do anything that he is being told to do. But what Doug and found is that... And sometimes he wants yeah. to go to the principal's office. That's his goal, <laughs> right? He wants to get thrown out. He, he wants attention. Oh. He wants whatever it is. Right, right. So how do you get him instead to uh, to focus on his work and the task at hand? There's a crazy, there's a lot of psychological mind games going on. And, and what Doug found is that what effective teachers would do is be extremely specific in their direction. So in, in even the most highly charged situations, um, you can diffuse them by giving students um, an alternative thing that they can do that's very specific. So um, walk to your desk, sit down, open your binder, put away your paper in this folder, close your binder, put it in your backpack and get back to work is a very much more effective um, redirection than to focus on what's going wrong. One of the insights that you talk about of Lamal, which I found fascinating and didn't really appreciate from when I read his book or when we had him on is, is the role of language. And, mm -hmm. and, and as, as he talked about on this program, he tried to draw the lessons for teaching that he has drawn from watching hours and hours of videotape of successful teachers. It's not just his, the, you know, his personal theory of, I wonder if this, oh, this will probably work better. He's actually claims to have, you know, seen this in action over and over and over again. But this idea of language and giving teachers a language to communicate seems to me to be extremely important and unappreciated. So explain that. Sure. Um, so I actually, it was interesting because I learned this lesson from Doug, but I also in parallel learned it by traveling to Japan. Um, so I think that one of the features of the American education system that holds us back from t treating teaching as a craft is that we have no professional language to talk about teaching. So if you think about other highly complex work, like building a bridge or architecture or medicine or law, there's a lot of um, terms of art that help you have a more granular view of what it is you're doing. and um, But teaching doesn't have this, at least not in the U.S. So Doug started as a um, uh, an accountability-minded consultant who would help teachers and schools study data, um, student assessment data about what each student was struggling with, and then try to use that data to change their practice. But what he found is that he came up against a wall where he was able to identify what students couldn't do, but he had no language to describe what teachers should do instead to help them learn what they were not understanding. And one of the ways that this came into focus for him was when um, he would take teachers to see better teachers in action, have them watch a, a better practitioner, a more expert practitioner do the things that the teacher should be doing, but they would take away the wrong lessons. And I think that's because they were watching this very complicated um, work, very interactive, um, that has many different elements, but they had no language to describe the parts of the performance that they were supposed to be paying attention to. So what he came to do is try to name the more granular pieces of teaching work that he could use to help teachers see them better and make it make that invisible work more visible. And um, it turns out that in Japan, uh, where there's a very different culture that focuses on teaching as a craft, um, there actually is just this same kind of language to describe teaching. There are words in Jap Japanese that there is no translation for in English because they are professional teaching craft words. Um, so I, I found that very interesting as well. Yeah, I, I, it really is extraordinary because you don't really appreciate how important language is in that context. I, I'm giving an example from a different uh form of craft that uh, I mentioned here before that that you're uh, that this idea reminds me of which is say hitting a baseball mm -hmm. so 
you know, you have a kid who's struggling, and I've been a little league coach, you have a kid who's struggling, and, and there are two things that are of absolutely no value whatsoever. But little league coaches, I hear them say it over and over again, and I said it over and over again until I realized how unhelpful it was. They'll say things like, uh, well, you got to try harder. Now, <laughs> you know, if you have a, a teacher who's mediocre, giving them a pep talk is, if, it just doesn't, they don't know what to do. W- right. How do I, how do I implement this? I, I want to try harder. A lot of teachers, I think, do want to do better. Yeah. But yes. then there's specific stuff that's still useless, like keep your eye on the ball. And <laughs> right. keep your eye on the ball is clearly one of the most important lessons you have to teach a kid who wants to learn how to hit. But if you're not thinking about it, you don't, we don't teach, most coaches don't teach their kids how to keep your eye on the ball. You think, well, what's so hard about it? You just keep your eye on the ball. No, because mm-hmm. hitting involves mm-hmm. moving your head mm-hmm. uh, counterclockwise as the ball comes into the plate. But while your body is turning, excuse me, your, your head is turning clockwise, your body's turning counterclockwise. If you're a right-handed hitter, as you swing mm-hmm. the bat, you're, mm-hmm. you're pivoting your hip around uh, counterclockwise mm-hmm. to drive the ball, but your head has to go in that other direction. But what happens right. is most kids, their head goes with their hips. So their head right. spins out of the strike zone. They don't see the right. ball and they miss it. So the coach right. says, oh, you, I watched. See, you didn't keep your eye on the ball. You don't tell them how. Right. You have no right. chance of helping them. So I think this language thing, and the, I love your point about granularity. You can break things down into smaller steps. You yeah. actually have a chance of achieving something. Yes, and it's the same thing that if you think about it, that what to do technique um, that Doug uses with students and the teachers he studies use with students, it's the same thing for teachers. So um, it's not enough to tell the kid who's having an emotional overreaction to stop having an emotional overreaction. You have to give that kid actual concrete things that he can do. And um, what's complicated about teaching is that, you know, baseball is a great example. Um, we as expert practitioners, and I'm not going to pretend that I'm one, but maybe you as an expert practitioner of swinging a baseball bat, you can say, keep the eye, your eye on the ball means something to you that you have not unpacked because you have become an expert at it. So it has become in- invisible to you. Right. Similarly to, you know, when we learn to read, um, it's invisible to us as readers of the English language, why um, the combination, certain combinations of letters make different sounds in different contexts and different words. But as teachers, um, we have to unpack those things that we now take for granted, decompose them into their steps um, and make them visible to children so that they can learn. And it's not so simple as just doing what you already know how to do. You have to say, well, why did you get the wrong answer and and reverse engineer the mistake that they made into the steps that they would have to take to get the right answer. And of course, part of the problem is that uh, because it's invisible, you want it to be invisible. You want it to be so ingrained yeah. that you don't have to think yeah. about it or else you're not going to do it very well. So it, there's a certain tension there. Um, Absolutely. Let's stick with discipline for a minute and um, – or classroom behavior or whatever. Discipline as a negative can have a negative connotation. I, I, I mentioned a disciplinarian, which has a certain pejorative characteristic uh, sound to it. But I, I just find people who can keep their classrooms controlled. Um, yeah. The charter school movement that you talk about with Doug Lamov and others – um, is extreme was extremely regimented in the early days and to some extent still is. Um, talk about what, what no excuses means and um, there was a bit of a backlash against that. So explain that. Yeah, sure. So the um, no excuses is the term that I use to describe a certain movement of charter schools that arose in the 90s doesn't characterize all charter schools, but a, a certain group that um, Doug Lamov is a part of and KIPP is a part of, um, if people have heard of KIPP, um, Achievement First, there's several different brand names. And what they all share is this idea that um, we we have for too long had made excuses for low achievement in uh, high poverty settings. Um, and so we have to uh, instead of having making excuses, as Doug uh, characterized this approach, hug them to Harvard, right? If we just show these <laughs> poor black children enough love, then they'll they'll make it out and change their life path. No, we have to, you know, that is a form of racism in and of itself. We have to have extremely high standards for kids, and that applies to behavior um, very much first and foremost. We have to start with having a foundation of 
um, order. And that means um, every, you know, we're going to be radical about that because it's, it's a path to fighting poverty and ending racism. And so radical order means in a classroom, things like we, we will have no talking in the hallways, even in high schools. So students will walk silently in straight lines. We will, you know, even in many schools, they, they have actual, um, they, they, were, they put tape along the hallways to demarcate the exact line on which the students should walk. Um, and, and lunch will also be silent to create order and, and explain the priorities the priority that learning has here in the school and then to change the culture of the school away from chaos and toward focused academic work. Um, so that's the idea behind no excuses. But um, as you say, I can, there, there's been a rethinking even within that movement of exactly how effective that approach is. It's pretty creepy sounding for starters. <laughs> and, and when you see it in action and, and it, it comes up even in more uh, less creepy, but, but um, everyday settings such as, having all the students answer a question at the same time, go through a set of yeah. physical motions in the classroom, say, yeah. to answer, um, ra- you know, raising their hand in certain ways to signify answers. It, it yeah. reeks to some people a little bit of, of fascism. And yeah. uh, so what was the backlash and where are we now, do you think? So I tell the story of a um, student of Doug Lamov's um, who became a teacher named Rousseau Miezi, and I think he exemplifies the backlash um, within the movement. I mean, with outside, there are critics um, from the beginning who have said this is wrong. Um, but the more interesting thing to me is the internal critics. So uh, Rousseau was a student at Doug's first school, and he described just the the um, unhappiness in many ways of the students living in this discipline system and also um, questions that were raised in the students' minds about what they were really learning. Were they learning to be in, uh, independent decision makers about their own behavior um, and how to conduct themselves as students or were they um, so heavily structured that when they faced structure, unstructured reality of the, of the real world and college and work, they didn't know what to do. Um, they were filled with resentment for their teachers as well as for this order. Many of them dropped out of school. Um, so, so that's the backlash. And I also tell the story of a school, a KIPP school in Newark that um, had the same experience. They had, you know, radical order. Um, and then they started to see that the same students who had seemed to be um, so positively affected by this order who were very happy to be part of the structure when they were in fifth grade. By the time they got to eighth grade, were rebelling, resentful, and hadn't learned very much from what had seemed to be um, a very strong learning environment towards order. They didn't know how to conduct themselves. As soon as they got on the bus to drive home from school, they were acting out and fighting. So so the question is, why, why did this happen? What are students actually learning from all this structure? Um, and what's the solution? I think the one solution that folks are coming up against that um, is does seem to be successful is not to abandon structure. You know, there's to, not to treat um, discipline just as any other academic subject. Like a, there's a choice between uh, total teacher direction and total student direction, um, but instead to create different kinds of structure that allow for students to get a lot of guidance from their teachers, but to still be independent. So at the school in Newark, they, um, you know, erased the silent hallways, but still had monitors in the hallways and had consequences for behavior, but created more opportunities for students to make behavioral mistakes that the faculty could then unpack with the students so that they could think through um, what they had done as well as have consequences. So adding this extra dimension seems to be effective. Of course, the other extreme is uh, school should be fun. And I (laughs) I find that um, a little bit scary because learning is hard work and it's not always fun. It's exhilarating at the end sometimes, ideally, but along the way, there's lots of stuff you have to give up doing like watching TV or playing video games to master, say, your basic math skills. And any particular skill is not always so fun. When you see a great proof, can be you want to cheer, but that doesn't always happen. So right. do you think this is a um, a problem in the American public school system, the, the fun problem, the dumbing down of, of the lack of rigor? 
Definitely the lack of rigor is a problem. Um, I'm not sure if it originates from a desire to have fun. I think that's probably one element, but I, I think it also has to do with a, a lack of content knowledge on the part of teachers and a lack of good materials, curriculum materials to support rigorous learning. But yes, I mean, one, one of the things that I, one of the educators I write about is named Deborah Ball, and she talks about how um, some people go into teaching because they just love children <laughs> and that's not a good enough reason. Yeah. It's maybe a precondition, uh, an important condition, but not necessary. Um, so school is not, not camp. And not school sufficient. is about academics. Would you say? And yeah. it's not sufficient. It's neither it's necessary or yeah. nor sufficient. Exactly. So yes, I, I think that, um, I think there's a huge rigor problem and there's lots of reasons for it, but, but you know, certainly one of them might be that our culture doesn't value, you know, is a little bit anti-intellectual. <laughs> yeah. Let's move on to accountability, which is um, you associate uh, with Rick Hanischek. Rick Hanischek's been a guest on Econ Talk many times. What was the idea behind it and how has it manifested itself? When do you think of it now? Where do you think we stand with it? So um, I, I, Rick, I think of as the father of teacher accountability. And I think that it came, his idea came about from a set of um, very persuasive research findings that for who, the natural conclusion of which was teacher accountability. So those findings are that uh, the teacher of all the factors under a school's control makes the biggest difference in whether students will succeed academically in school. Um, and, but we don't have any uh, inputs about teachers that we can use to predict in advance who will be successful, meaning no character traits, no traits about whether they've gone to have, have certain degrees or certifications. And so as a result, um, and, and yet we focus all of our resources on these inputs rather than on the output, um, which does seem to matter of whether this teacher influences students' achievement. So the natural conclusion that Rick makes is, um, given that we have this distribution of some good and some bad teachers, uh, and we have all of our cards in the wrong place, we've put all of our investments in um, incentivizing inputs rather than outputs. So let's instead um, think about how to uh, identify which teachers are successful in the classroom and reward them, and then think about how to um, eliminate the teachers who are unsuccessful in the classroom. And today that idea manifests in, um, I think the Obama administration has embraced this idea. Rick describes how he used to be a, um, a real kook. Nobody wanted to listen to him talk about this idea, but now he's, he's the establishment. Um, and we have uh, teacher evaluations are one of the hallmark policies of the Obama administration, meaning the evaluations that public school teachers are given, which have historically assigned, you know, 99% of teachers as effective are now being pushed to be more discriminating and to have more weight in decisions that are high stakes, like tenure decisions. Um, so, so that's the accountability idea. And I don't think it's, I think that the only flaw that it has is that it fails to account for this other important piece, which is what teachers um, need to learn to do along the way in order to uh, become good or bad. Um, and, you know, there's lots of other sort of nuances about that idea, but the big one I think is that it, uh, accountability alone is not going to be enough. It hasn't been enough in improving schools and I don't think it will be enough in improving teachers. They also are going to need development and supports. So it raises the question, which, um, why don't they get it? Right. Why is not, I didn't make, that's not, I didn't phrase that very well. I meant, why don't they get these skills? Why isn't it, uh, you know, I'm an economist. I'm a big believer in power of competition. I think that's a huge problem. Maybe we'll talk about it a little bit about our current school system is not sufficiently competitive, but most of the people in teaching actually do care about the, the students. Uh, yeah. they, they would prefer to be a good teacher than a bad one. Uh, it's true that being a great teacher requires a lot of work and people are, I think, often eager not to work so hard, but put that to the side. Most of them care. It's yeah. striking to me how little uh, the craft part of teaching gets conveyed uh, just because even for, for, you know, forget the, I want to be the greatest teacher of all time. Just I'd like my students to learn something. Why isn't why aren't principals teaching their helping their their teachers learn mm -hmm. to be great? Yeah, um, better. I 
So if we start by thinking about what is a system where it, this is working, and then we think, are these fe the features that make that system work um, appearing in the traditional public school system? I think that's a good way to answer your question. So Doug Lamov's, um schools on common schools are, that's an organization that is a network of charter schools that really treat teaching as a craft and create supports for teachers to um, do well so that principals can do that rational thing you're talking about, help their teachers do what most teachers want to do, be better. Um, well, how does that work in uncommon schools? One thing that they have is they have a rational organization of the work day. So teachers have time when they're teaching and they also have time when they're not actively working with students, but instead studying the curriculum with each other, um, watching other teachers teach, um, learning about teaching and the craft and the curriculum together. They have whole data days when they can uh, step back from their work and study student data, whether that's a uh, standardized test data or student work that they're looking at together. Um, so they have organization of work that allows them to do that. Another feature they have is they have a common curriculum. So that allows teachers to learn together. Um, they have, uh, instead of one teacher in one school working on one problem and another teacher in another school having a totally different curriculum, they can have a common conversation about, you know, why is this, are our students not understanding division of fractions? In third grade when we've decided they should learn that and what can we do about it. Um, there's, they have also a system of subject specific uh, teacher groups. So um, if you think about the difference between what it means to be an effective English teacher versus an effective math teacher, there's a lot that a person observing a math teacher at work needs to know about math in order to give the math teacher good uh, feedback. Um, and that's so specific, that kind of knowledge, that it's very unlikely that someone will have that detailed knowledge about all of the subjects in a school. Um, but uh, in a traditional public school system, the only person observing a teacher generally is the principal, who is either one content area expert or an uh, maybe a former gym teacher, right? So how can that principal be expected to give the highly detailed feedback? Instead, in uncommon schools where Doug works, um, teachers work with subject-specific groups. So a math expert will watch a math teacher, and they will have content groups together within this network of schools that can work together on that specific skill and the specific questions of math teaching or the specific questions of the developmental age of the students. So, these, so those are three features I just mentioned that make uncommon schools able to do this obvious rational thing, help teachers be better. They have the organization of work, they have a common curriculum, and they have subject-specific mentorship. Well, in the U.S. public, in the traditional school system, um, none of that exists. We do not have a common curriculum, even within some school districts, um, and we do not have organization of work that allows teachers to do pretty much anything in their own time in their official time or their spare time other than work with teach with students so they don't have time to observe each other unless they're you know defying the defying their rules and regulations of their school system um, and they do not have a common curriculum and they do not have subject specific mentors so uh, I think you know there's many other features other than that but Basically, my answer is that the system has been designed um, kind of the worst possible way you would want in order to help teachers learn to be better. Yeah, Arnold Kling on this on Econ Talk has said that education is about feedback. It's about mm -hmm. helping your students understand what they know and don't know. And But that works for teachers too. And if teachers don't learn what works and doesn't work, and most of us only learn that through education, uh, as you point out in the book, most teachers are just sort of in this little island called their classroom. They don't get a lot of feedback from uh, mentors or peers or uh, they only get the feedback from their students. And that, that's something yeah. you, you learn something if you're paying attention, but yeah. not like you'd learn if you share ideas and you talk about it, et cetera. So one right. one response to your point, which um, so I'm, I'm I'm with you, I'm having having seen my wife transform her classroom through these ideas and and work with other teachers in her school and and get the feedback from them it's i think it's an incredibly transformative process but one might say well elizabeth you've drunk the Kool-Aid you've you've been charmed or 
you know, Doug LaMob's data is not really data. You've, you've been, you've been mm-hmm. suckered in. You're, you're just, uh, mm-hmm. you're just, you're just, you've over romanticized the, the, mm-hmm. the effectiveness of this. What, what do you say in response to that? Uh, and, and let me ask it a different way. Mm-hmm. Would you push to see those techniques put into public schools? And again, uh, do you think that's, that might happen? Is it, is it happening in any way right now? Mm-hmm. Because I see some signs of it in my reading on the educational field. I think there's a lot of positive change happening in in lots of places. Um, in terms of am I overly romantic? Um, you know the you know like what Rick would say. And by the way, I just heard from Rick having hit, he just finished the book and he said I nearly persuaded him, but not quite. So um, <laughs> I'll, don't I, worry, I, Elizabeth. I'll work on him. I I, I see him time to time. <laughs> I'm going to give him a hard time. Well, I treat that as a as a real accomplishment. Um, he and I think here's my attempt to summarize the the best counter Rick Hanushek counter argument, and that would be okay. You know, it's nice to say that anyone could learn to teach, or that a certain if we do a good job on recruitment, we also have to go, do a good job on development. But why then is is it that for a hundred plus years we've had schools of education whose sole business was to train teachers? We've had a, a professional development structure for teachers in the U.S. whose costs, um, you know, there's different ways to measure the size of the budget on professional development, but the best one I've seen is $9 billion a year. Um, We have all of this investment that we've made in helping teachers be better and it's all, um, there's no evidence that any of it has succeeded. So why are you telling me um, you know, it's nice to say all, all the things you said in your book, but against this evidence, why should we ever invest in something that so clearly uh, has no return? And so I think the answer to that is, let's just think about the numbers and who's in this profession. There's 3.7 million teachers in this country. The turnover rates, especially given baby boomer retirement patterns, are huge. We have not only existing teachers who um, need to change their practice, but we also have uh, new teachers who are coming in, as many as a million of them in the next 15 years, 15 to 20 years, um, who are going to need to be trained. We're going to have to do something to ensure that they have a responsible level of practice before they get into the classroom. What standard of evidence do we need before we, in the moment, make the policy decision that we want to have them be responsible? We all, we, what we do know is that there, the different levels of teaching practices um, lead to dramatically different levels of student learning. So if we only want to intervene at the accountability level and only want to remove those uh, ineffective teachers, well, then we're going to still be left with the task of finding people to replace them who are going to have to meet some kind of responsible level before they start. So I think the question is, you know, it's a, the difference between policy and research. We can, the standard of evidence um, that we need to act, I think can, logic can be a standard of evidence. And since we already have $9 billion, why don't we change the way we spend it? Yeah, I think about the baseball example we talked about earlier. Uh, when you look at a major league baseball player, they're really good at hitting a baseball, but they still have a coach and they still have batting practice every almost every day, which suggests yeah. that, Coaching in practice makes you better. And I think yeah. if, if we said, okay, well, let's have, instead of hiring people we think are good coaches to coach the hitters, let's just take some fans out of the stands because they've been watching baseball. They can probably do a good job. <laughs> exactly. And I think that's what describes, and they, they know something, right? It's not like they know nothing, but that's right. what describes to me the professional de- development aspect of teaching right now, which is very similar to education schools. We'll have a provocative day about neurology and how the brain processes information rather than Let's practice how to keep uh, disruptive students from ruining the experience for everybody and get them involved rather mm-hmm. than just sent to the principal's mm-hmm. office. And I think mm-hmm. that's the, the problem we have is the money has been spent, as you said, it's been spent poorly, but that doesn't yeah. mean that it can't be spent well. Having, yeah. having said that, it's not obvious that we can spend it, spend it well given the current incentives of the public school system. Yeah, or I would even rephrase that to say the the lack of infrastructure. Like, so I can point to programs that are small but promising for which there is evidence um, to support the idea that 
a person who, you know, as an average mortal human being can be trained to be as good of a teacher as the best teachers Doug Lamov studies, um, because those programs do exist, but there are real impediments to scaling those programs. So I write about a program um, that the Stanford researcher Pam Grossman created in the San Francisco Unified School District, where they are showing uh, that they're through, you know, not, not, uh, overly expensive interventions, but well-designed interventions able to help secondary English teachers um, do a better job of helping their students to reach the common core standards for English. Um, but the, one of the key elements of that program is Pam Grossman and her, her cohort who teach this program. And there is only one Pam Grossman in this country. There are, there are not that many Pam Grossman graduate students in this country. Um, there are many effective and excellent English teachers, but there are not enough of them to uh, help all change the system and do that kind of teaching. Um, there may be a way to MOOCify Pam Grossman, but I haven't seen it yet. Uh, what they were doing in that professional development was not unlike what Doug Lamob describes with um, these approximation, approximations of practice rehearsals where teachers actually rehearse and have a an observer who is knowledgeable about effective teaching watch them and give them feedback in the moment during their rehearsal. So how do you do that in a way at scale when not only do we not have the right knowledge in the teaching profession, but we don't have the right knowledge in outside of the teaching profession to teach the teachers? So I, I see that as one of the biggest challenges. Uh, I don't like the word MOOC. We're stuck with it. But now you've added an even worse word, MOOCify, but it's very useful. I like that a lot. Um, let's um, let's talk about the reaction to your book. Uh, it came out, I think, in June of this year. Is that correct? August. August. Oh, really? I, when did I see June? Uh, have you had – well, then I'm, maybe it's not a good question. You'll tell me. Have teachers – have you gotten much reaction from teachers? Uh, or is mm -hmm. it too early? No, I have. Um, I think you're thinking there's an excerpt of the book that appeared in the New York Times magazine at the end of June. So, or at the end in July. Um, so maybe that's what you're thinking of, but yeah, teachers have started to read it and I've been really, really gratified by their response because, you know, I'm not a teacher and there's definitely a lot of teachers who I think rightfully question, um, anybody who's not a teacher pretending to know what they do. Um, but actually that's the reason I wrote the book is that I had been an education journalist without knowing anything about teaching. And I realized that the gaps in my understanding were so significant that I was really misreading the policy questions. Um, so, so I've been gratified that um, a lot of teachers seem to really not only see themselves in the book and feel that their work is accurately captured, but they, they find things that they can learn from. So I've been very excited about that. You talk about your education, uh, your journalism background. You're the co-founder of Chalkbeat which is a yeah. news site uh, covering news related to educational change. And you have an explicit goal of improving public schools. Um, it, tell us a little bit about Chalkbeat. Oh, sure. So um, I, so the first teacher who changed my life was uh, John Mathwin, my high school journalism teacher. I grew up in the D.C. suburbs in a, and went to a high school that had a significant racial and class achievement gap. And John Mathwin was ran the student newspaper um, and helped me, introduce me to the idea that journalism could make a difference. Um, but, and I, in, indeed, through writing for the school paper about the achievement gap in my school, um, I saw that I could make a contribution starting a conversation about uh, inequity in the school, as well as the policies that seem to be either supporting that or holding, holding back efforts to make change. Um, and, but then when I went into the workforce, I found that there was no uh, n commercial media organization or existing media organization that I could work for that really matched this vision that Mr. Mathwin um, instilled in me. So uh, the end result of that is that m some friends and I created our own uh, news organization and the idea was to create a business model that could better support the the mis social mission that we see for journalism. So that's what Chalkbeat is. It's um, all of our reporters live in the communities they cover, um, unlike the traditional model of education reporting where people will parachute into a community from far away. We actually are there every day. We write daily stories about the subject and we have 
um, an explicit idea about what our mission is and how we think that journalism leads to social impact. Um, so now we're in four communities, New York City, Memphis, Tennessee, Denver, Colorado, and Indiana. And we're seeking to expand to the more, many more communities that have reached out to us to ask for a bureau in their neighborhood. So in a video about Shark Beat, uh, you say the following. Our job is to help people in communities make more informed decisions about education, close quote. But I would argue that the current educational system isn't designed to allow more informed people to make decisions. And I see that as the largest problem in our educational environment, kind of the underlying problem and all the things that we try to do to reform the school system, like the Common Core or the No Child Left Behind or whatever the latest fad is, are desperate end around attempts to deal with the fact that people are spending other people's money. Students are not really the consumer. Um, the parents aren't mm -hmm. the consumers. And the whole system is uh, is got this terrible fl design flaw that fails to incentivize uh, excellence. Uh, get, react to that, please, and uh, give me some give me a little optimism. Against that. <laughs> um, well, I, I all I want to do is ask you several follow up questions about what would a better design be of a public system to have a. So I'm curious, like. I don't want a public. You, I don't want a public system. I want an unpublic system to emerge with all of its diversity and flavor and trial and error that everything else in our economy does so mm -hmm. much better. And I don't want a business model. I hate it when people say, "Oh, he's against the public system. He wants to have a business model, or he wants mm -hmm. he wants there to be competition." That's what businesses do. I mm -hmm. assume I assume education in a non-public education world would be nonprofit like it is in the private school system. There would be mm -hmm. schools that had charity that would help people who couldn't afford to pay tuition, just like mm -hmm. there are now, even with our wasteful public school system, we have that. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you're right. I don't have an answer to that question. That That's, uh, and I don't have to. That's the beauty of my approach. <laughs> uh, oh, right. We don't have to design anything centrally if it's not centrally designed. Yeah. It's a, it's a yeah. great trick. Um, I mean, op giving you optimism, I think that there are people who uh, need better information to make better decisions at every level and who want it, like not unlike teachers. You know, teachers are buying Doug Lamov's book in by the thousands, hundreds of thousands, because they want better information. And I think the same applies to parents and they do have some some power, very limited power, but they have some, and especially to administrators, policymakers. I mean, that's why I assume that's why I'm going, you know, the 400 bureaucrats at the U.S. Department of Education are gathering on Thursday and inviting me to talk with them as part of a professional development series that apparently they have. So I think that, you know, no matter, the reality is that information will affect decision-making patterns. Um, you know, our ideas about what what will make a difference like Rick's ideas did. They Rick's ideas directly led, you could argue, to many of the elements of the race to the top uh, competitive grant system. Um, other ideas continue to influence people's actions, parents' actions about which houses to buy, but also which teachers to advocate for and how to organize themselves and be part of a democratic political process. Um, and my view is that there's, we should have uh, the pr the press's job is to make sure that whatever information people are using um, is better quality and that they have access to it. So it's not perfect, but that's the best we can we can hope for in a democracy. Does Chalkbeat push a particular policy agenda? Is it? Do you want to see say more charter schools or more accountability or more standards? Do you have a view either as, no, as Elizabeth on those Green questions, no. or Chalkbeat? <laughs> We no, we don't take a view on those questions because I think that there our our role is to help people see the the pluses and the minuses which do exist. And everyone who works for us, it's not like we're hiding a secret agenda that we do have but can't say or prohibited from saying. It's that we truly see that um, charter schools add some benefits and have some costs, and as is true with every policy. So our job is not to make the decisions, but to help people have the complete full picture before they make the decisions. And I think you'll, when you talk to most journalists, you'll find that um, they chose journalism for a reason, because it's hard to make those decisions. And 
for us at least, it's it's easier to paint the picture of what the world looks like. You know, like with this book, I can tell you what teaching takes and what it takes to make successful teachers, but I can't tell you the exact steps for how to change our policy structure to get there because there there's lots of um, decisions that we'll have to make through the democratic political process that are, is not my job to make. Yeah, I, I view that as a very flawed process relative to some others, but that's okay. Um, I, I, I like I like your optimism. Uh, before we close, you, uh, as you say, you're not a teacher, but you did spend some time teaching and, and writing your book. Uh, talk briefly about that. Yeah, um, my friend who, Andy Snyder, is a New York City public school teacher, and he said that I would be a fraud if I didn't even try it before writing the book. And I said, well, in that case, should we expect um, – all political reporters to run for office before they cover politics or should we um, ask every New York Daily News reporter to have married Kim Kardashian before writing for the New York Daily News. But um, anyway, he won the argument and I had to, I I taught his class for a few lessons. Um, It was exhilarating. It was um, a, a great way to recognize that teaching really, really is a very cognitively challenging craft. Um, and it opened up a lot of, uh, lessons for me. Maybe one that was most powerful was, uh, Doug Lamov in particular had talked to me a lot about love. Teachers like to talk about love, a little uncomfortable for me as somebody who was trying to rearrange my idea of this profession beyond like sort of, Oh, all you have to do is love kids to appreciating the science of the craft. But they kept even as they were showing me how challenging their work was and how much of a craft it was, they also kept talking about love. So I had to figure out some way to understand that. And it wasn't until um, I taught Andy's class that I think I really did come to understand that because I had this moment with a student where she, I, I said something wrong to sort of set her off against me. And I didn't know what to do in that moment because she, I had alienated this one student. She was defiant. Um, and I had lost her and the whole class had this really tense moment when we had to figure out what were we going to do? Cause I had offended her. She was sort of growling at me underneath her breath. And the only thing that came to mind was what Doug had told me and what Andy had told me about love. And I just looked at her and I thought, I love you. (laughs) And I, and, and sounds really cheesy and corny, but Every teacher I, you know, I've talked to understands that uh, there's something important about really deciding to love each student and respect them as a person and see their point of view and give up yourself in the moment. And um, I was able to, if not completely um, salvage my relationship with her, move forward in a way that was productive because I looked at her with respect. And uh, anyway, it was it was a life changing experience teaching, and that was one of the most powerful moments. And my wife says, uh, it's not about me, it's about them. And uh, that yeah. seems obvious, but uh, it's not for two reasons. One is naturally we tend to think it's always about me. <laughs> yeah, That's number one. But number two, and I, I, I didn't think about this until you told that story, uh, as a teacher, and it doesn't matter whether you're in a, in a third grade class or a college classroom, there's a certain power relationship between the person at the front of the room and the people in the, in the chairs. Yeah. And if you indulge that, Uh, in the wrong way. You create a natural hostility, which exists in many classrooms. We've all been there as students and uh, occasionally as as teachers. And it's it's a terrible thing. When you change your perspective that it's not about you and it's not about you bossing them around and telling what they need to learn, it's about you helping them learn, which it seems, it's a cliche and it seems obvious, but it's not obviously easily implemented. Uh, it changes everything and it changes their whole attitude toward what you are expounding. And I think, um, I I take exactly your point. I think love's underrated. Yes. Yes. And I love the way your wife puts it. That's exactly it. It's, it's not, so it it actually is a science in and of itself to, um, focus on another person's emotional point of view and figure out what the proper response is. And what, one thing that it requires that is, incredibly challenging is just to completely erase your sense of yourself in the moment and only focus on the other person. Um, and that's true whether you're teaching them math and you have to think about what they, how they're thinking about a problem or whether you're just dealing with their emotional response. So it's, it, it's the love, love is a science. That was my conclusion. My guest today has been Elizabeth Green. Her book is Building a Better Teacher. Elizabeth, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks so much for having me.
This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.